This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. You know, our detractors often ask how we can justify resisting Francis. They often posit the nonsensical idea that popes cannot be resisted, that they are luminous beings, little different than divine oracles, sent directly from God Almighty, hand chosen by him to lead the church, and that they are always right in all important circumstances. It's a ridiculous caricature of the Catholic understanding of the papacy, but it is one we have to address here because today a couple of news items emerged over the past few days that have gotten little attention. Francis has further subverted the Pontifical Academy for Life by appointing a servant of Moloch to a post in that formerly august body. And at the same time as that, he sent a priest and a nun to an important United Nations conference to assist the powers of the world to control the flow of data and information in the name of accompaniment and dialogue, of course. And all that happened while he extends the synod of synodality. Amidst this, Bishop Schneider tells us why we must resist these errors. So let's get into this today. Well, let's take a brief detour and first check in with some news about Francis that shows that he will almost certainly be around until probably January or February of 2025, which on the upside gives him plenty of time to repent, but on the downside gives him plenty of time to continue crafting a new religion with the Catholic label attached to it. And if you guess that that was the story that I hinted at, where he extends the synod of synodality, you'd be correct. The National Catholic Reporter breaks the story. Headline, Pope Francis extends synod of bishops a year. Two Vatican meetings now planned. The reasoning is simple. Hardly anyone participated in the Synod of Synodality. Most of you didn't, and when the numbers are broken down, only like one-tenth of one percent of Catholics in the developed world even knew about the Synod of Synodality, which is what that Synod of Bishops are talking about is here. So the Vatican is extending it to get more voices involved in the process. You know, that's an awfully nice thing of them to do, but I'm betting more people will call for the ordination of priestesses and the regularization of the James Martin parody of matrimony and the rest of it, since the data backs up the fact that most self-described Catholics in the Western world want those things and more, that they want the cha faith changed in fundamental ways. The synod of synodality would be tiresome by itself, but this image that a listener sent in some time ago is accurate. The synodal process is leading souls to perdition. Which leads me to this. If you're the type who hate watches what I do here, I do have to ask, what will it take for you to admit that there's a major problem in Rome? What will it take for you to admit that Francis probably isn't a Catholic? That he's the, trying to destroy the church from within? What will it take for you to admit that Francis is helping the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ take the church over, subvert it, and use it to promote their own evil ideas in the world, to fundamentally change the world? Here's the latest proof of concept for you. On Twitter, Edward Penton, a noted and respected Catholic reporter who is a moderate voice in our times, reports that Francis has appointed an out-and-out -out enemy of Christ to the Pontifical Academy for life. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see a picture of here on your screen where this woman is talking at a press conference for her primary employer. And that employer is one I can't name on YouTube for various reasons, but I suspect that employer is why she has been appointed to that position on the Pontifical Academy for Life. It's the same organization bent on restarting all of civilization by the end of this decade, promising that we'll all be happy because we won't own anything and we'll all be forced into functional veganism or eating insects by a new government of their making that oversees everything in the created world. Certainly not a message in line with the gospel or the purposes of the Pontifical Academy for Life for that matter, but then again, she spoke at a Vatican conference in 2021 on universal basic income, Francis's Laudato C program, and the affliction of 2020, and why everyone needed to submit to the program of the secular rulers, who demanded we take their solution to that problem, or we wouldn't be able to work. The person's name is Mariana Mazzucato, and she's a self-described atheist who loves this quote-unquote pope, which should tell you something. And of course, best of all, she's deeply aligned with all those satanic forces trying to recraft and rest restart civilization by the end of the decade. I have to repeat that because it's worth repeating. And she is predictably a stridently pro-Moloch advocate, which is why Francis put her on the Pontifical Academy for Life in the first place. An article from the National Catholic Register 
published about a year ago on this topic, shows that this woman, along with several other enemies of Christ, were present at a Pontifical Academy for Social Sciences conference in the Vatican last year. That is a separate Pontifical Academy, one that I'm not sure why exists. And the purpose of their address there was to take advantage of the 2020 affliction and response to it in order to help promote their program for greater control over the lives of all people everywhere, because the Vatican is for some reason involved in that. But at the most basic level, Mazzucato has been a vociferous defender of the Moloch ritual, access to it and the legal enthronement of the Moloch ritual as a cornerstone of modern society. Yes, this woman has been appointed to work at the Pontifical Academy started to oppose the Moloch ritual, and she is a fighter for the Moloch ritual. At the same time that Francis is making a mockery of the Pontifical Academy for Life by appointing people who are its avowed adversaries to be members of the, the Academy, Francis is also sending influential women religious to speak to the UN's ongoing conference, whose purpose is to restrict what can be said on the internet. Think about that for a moment. And it's not just the internet either, and other forms of digital communication. Because of course the Vatican's involved in that too. Headline from Vatican News. Holy See, digital technology must serve the common good. The UN quote-unquote plenipotentiary conference, dedicated to telecommunications in Bucharest, saw the contribution of the Holy See in the persons of Sister Raffaella Petrini and Father Lucio Andrian Ruiz, who highlighted the need in a technological world to always respect the human person and to spread the gospel in the digital continent. Yeah, that's not concerning in the slightest, is it? It does beg the question, though. Who is Francis serving? Who is he putting the church at the disposal of? Because it doesn't look like it's Christ, not to me. This conference has a purpose, coordinating telecommunications around the world, which is a constantly changing landscape. The nun and priest in attendance stated that these technologies must be put to use for the common good, because dialogue relies on listening. That sounds familiar. That's because it's the same language used to sell the synod on synodality you know, the one that they just extended another year, and how Vatican II was such a great thing for the church because dialogue and accompaniment and that stuff. But from that article, quote, a specialized agency of the United Nations based in Geneva and heir to the Historical International Telecommunication Union, the ITU aims to coordinate the international use of the radio wave spectrum and satellite orbits. It establishes international telecommunication standards and promotes fair and affordable access to the integrated technologies needed for information and communications exchange, or ICT for short. It, meaning this UN agency, counts 193 member countries, and Vatican City State is one of them. There are also some 800 other members, including public and private companies, academic institutions, and international telecommunications organizations. The quote-unquote plenipotentiaries is the ITU's highest decision-making body, where the organization's general policies are defined and its ability to influence the development of ICT on a global level is determined. It's an area that is very, by nature, constantly being updated. The participation of the Vatican delegation in the PP22, explains Sister Raffaella Petrini, quote, is an opportunity to share in a broad international context in which governments faced with many difficult challenges are questioning and debating the future directions of global connectivity. Those principles that the Holy See and Vatican City State seek to apply in the development and concrete use of digital technology. In particular, she adds, it is a matter of promoting the growth of global communication platforms that are effective instruments of social cohesion and solidarity, as Pope Francis has repeatedly reiterated. We must aim to develop instruments of integration that are accessible to all segments of the population, while respecting human rights and cultural sensitivities and traditions with particular attention to women, young people, and people with disabilities. Quoting her directly again, sustainability, inclusiveness, development, and new opportunities in the field of technology, guided by fundamental principles such as respect for life, The dignity of work and care for our common home, says Father Ruiz, represent a challenge in which the Holy See can play a decisive role in the digital transformation of the millennium. End lengthy quote. You know, I always find it concerning when a nun sounds like a bureaucrat. 
But I'll remember, I'll remind you that it was not that long ago that Rome, through its American mouthpieces of Bishop Barron and Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church, called for the creation of a Catholic media certificate certification system that would allow the faithful to know who was trustworthy to watch, read, or listen to, and most importantly, who was not. Obviously, the only people who would have gotten that cert certification would have been pro-France's voices in the Catholic media. Thankfully, that project fell apart immediately, due in large part to the backlash the proposal generated when it was, when it was revealed in, I think it was 2019. But this is part and parcel of the same idea. The powers that be must restrict information and who can spread it. It's their own way of guarding their secular deposit of the anti-faith to control what can and cannot be said in these spaces online. Francis has sought to influence this through the bishops, but he's had no luck, and his secular allies want something similar on a much larger scale, which is evident by how I have to carefully talk about this topic instead of just bluntly stating the obvious here. It's clear through motives like this that Francis is remaking the church. He's obviously trying to change the faith and make the Catholic Church into something aligned with satanic forces of our world, those same people that are about enemies of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Bishop Athanasius Snyder spoke recently on how and why we must resist Francis, and I think his words are instructive here. He gave this to in an interview to the Remnant right at the tail end of the Catholic Identity Conference, and it, they just published it this weekend. But his advice will still be puzzling to some people because just a few weeks ago, Khan celebrated a Novus Ordo Mass with Francis when he visited Bishop Schneider's home country of Kazakhstan. But Gloria TV has the, a good summary here of this. Headline, Schneider, if we formally disobey Francis, we obey the church of all times. That statement, that strategy is, by the way, the exact reasoning of the SSPX and Archbishop Lefebvre for resisting the modernist takeover of the church after the council, and every action taken by them in the years after, including the most controversial actions they took. But I'm actually going to use the remnant article on the interview with the bishop for this. So from that article, quote, As the situation in the Catholic Church goes from bad to so much worse, Catholics all around the world are engaging in heated debates over how to admonish the Pope during this time of unprecedented crisis. In this new interview, which took place on October 1st, 2022, during the Catholic Identity Conference, Bishop Schneider lays out his position. It's no longer a question of if Catholics should admonish Pope Francis, but rather how. And in this regard, Bishop Schneider's words will be lauded by many for saying it is, but no doubt questioned by a few who will say he does not go far enough. End quote. So what's the gist of what he says? Well, he provides some basic guidance here. We must resist Francis and his program because we are to obey the church. That is his reasoning. He and we should oppose Francis because the church is not a dictatorship, saying, quote, In a dictatorship, everyone is afraid to speak out because the dictator will suddenly punish you. But that should not be the atmosphere in the church. And that this crisis is unique to the entire history of the Catholic Church. Basically, it sounds like he's saying he thinks that Francis is the worst pope in history because, frankly, most of the best, bad popes in history were merely personally immoral men. They were engaged in some pretty tasteless and nasty things in their private lives. But they didn't teach heresy, though there have been a few heretics throughout history that sat on the throne of Peter, but none of them measured up to the example Francis has set for the church. The Gloria TV article provides this bit of advice for the priests who have been canceled by Francis's immoral heretical allies among the bishops, including, you know, this was directed mostly at the Coalition for Canceled Priests. Quote, Therefore, he said, Francis's harmful orders should not be obeyed if they undermine the faith, or take away the treasure of the liturgy. Even if we would formally disobey, we will obey the whole church of all times. Schneider believes that canceled priests who oppose the dictatorship of Francis and his bishops cannot be fully independent and must have a superior. He thinks a priest that can still join forces with a, with a perhaps emeritus bishop, a traditional community, or Pius X, meaning the Society of St. Pius X, and of course they should, end quote. In other words, priests in that position should either try to join the SSPX or find a bishop in some position to submit to. How that works canonically is never really made clear in this article, but at least Schneider is providing some recognition of the plight the canceled priests are in and how it is perfectly licit to resist Francis, and not just licit, but actually our duty as Catholics 
to resist his satanic program for the church. But we must also resist him in order to save his soul, according to Schneider, to force a realization upon him before it's too late that he must repent. It's an interesting thing to remember. And remember, and remember, I do frequently tell you to pray for him, and many of you don't like that I tell you to pray for him. Not his intentions, but for him. Because we should not treat the church and the crisis as a political battle. The consequences are eternal in nature, not merely temporal and material like they are with politics. So I'm curious what you think of all this. Is Bishop Schneider correct in that the priests in that position should seek out either a retired bishop or maybe who, one who has himself been canceled by Rome to assist them in their ministry? What do you make of that UN visit by the nun and by the priest? And that Pontifical Academy for Life Appointment? Let me know what you think of all this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot as well. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.